know, it's good again to be back in Father Money. We, as has already been mentioned, we welcome all for coming and do trust the Lord will bless each for coming this afternoon. I'd like to turn to the Bible, please, to read two verses. First of all, one from the Old New Testament and then one from the New. In Romans chapter 10, please, and verse number 9, that if I shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then a verse from the Old Testament of Jeremiah, chapter 8 and verse number 20. And these are the words, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. You know the Lord will have a blessing to these very familiar verses from the Holy Scripture. <clears throat> On Friday, as we had the honour and on the sad occasion of speaking at a, a man's funeral who had passed away. And he was saved through this text that I have read to you this afternoon in Romans 10 and 9, over 60 years ago. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He was saved in his own room, in his own home, attending gospel meeting. When the truth of this text dawned upon his soul and put his trust alone in Christ the Saviour. So I thought of that, my mind was directed to this text today. And as we read this text together and speak about it, I do trust that maybe someone in the car, we read about people in the scriptures getting saved, a lady got saved by the riverside. There's a man got saved in the, in the jail, in the same chapter. And a little girl blessed at the roadside. And Nicodemus was saved at night time. And I was just hoping and praying today that someone in the car, here in Balamone, in the town hall car park, this would be the day of your salvation. You've noticed in the two verses that we have read, we have the thought of being saved or not being saved. We have read in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, those words, thou shalt be saved. And then we've read in Jeremiah chapter 8 and 20, those solemn tidings, those solemn words, that the harvest is past, the summer is ended. And those people on that occasion, their language was, we are not saved. I wonder this afternoon as we join together in this meeting, I do trust that as we look at this this evening, that it will be the experience of some, if you're not already saved, that even today, thou shalt be saved. Even today you'll experience this great manner of being saved. For it will be a dreadful tragedy. If there's some under the sound of our voice today, would miss salvation, leave it too late, drift into eternity without Christ, or leave it too late to the Lord to come, and you do be left behind. And then the language of your soul to be forever. Not saved. I don't think there's any more solemn words we could think about just now for souls. For eternity to experience what it would mean to be lost forever. Never to have been saved and to be lost and lonely. And without God and without Christ and to be lost forever. When we think of this text. I see, first of all, by these two words at the end of the text, I see a great concern here. Be saved. This is a word that's an Old Testament word. Of course, it's a New Testament word as well. And when we think of this word, I wonder often, does people understand what we mean when we speak about being saved? Here in the text, we have a concern about being, we must, be saved. We have that in Acts chapter 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men. And then we have these words. We must be saved. We do ask ourselves the question. Why must you and I be saved? Is it absolutely essential that you and I are saved? Well the word of God is very plain. The word of God would remind you and I it's because of what's behind us. It's because of our sin. That is the reason why 
you and I need to be rescued. That's why you and I need to be delivered. It's because of your sin and mine. The scriptures remind us concerning sin that there is no difference. That's a very solemn truth. That is a truth that we need to all understand from the Holy Scriptures. That is not just this class of people or that class of people. No, we all must be saved as because we all have sinned. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 22 and 3. There we are reminded of those solemn words that there is no difference. There is no difference. That means that there's no difference whatever. The whole human family, the whole human race, we all have sinned. We have all, to the scripture, missed the mark. We have all fallen short. God's standard is perfection. And there's only one that never sinned and couldn't sin. And that was God's beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the teaching of scripture wants you and I to understand clearly, be saved. We have to be must be saved as because of what is behind us it's because of the record god has a record of our sin i wonder do your soul do you ever think about that but if you're not saved as yet every sin that you have committed god has a record maybe that's some of paul some people would think you know that those sins were hidden sins those were secret sins. Dear friend, there's no such thing at all. Everything's open. Everything, dear soul, is seen by the all seen eye of God. And there's nothing hidden. And the word of God reminds the psalmist, realized this when he said, Oh, he said, there's things I done. Oh, he says, these things has I done. He realized he had committed sin. He realized he had sinned. And he says, God will set them in order before your eyes. That's, dear soul, the truth of the Holy Scripture. And we need to be saved. It's because of our sin. And what's beneath us? Well, the Word of God not only reminds of what's behind us. God has a record of every one of our sins of unforgiven. But you know the Word of God is plain reminding you of what's beneath us. Hell from beneath, the Bible says. Hell from beneath. I say it gently to all you dear friends and all listening to your voice just now. If you live in your sin, never have your sins forgiven, and die in your sin, the word of God reminds us that these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Oh, dear soul, think about what it would mean to experience what the Savior said in John chapter 8. As regarding those there on that occasion, he said, Listen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, who oh, he said, if you die in your sin, where I am, you cannot come. Oh, dear soul, there the reason why you must be saved and why I must be saved it is because of our sin. We used to sing S-I-A in the very little word. But it always spells disaster. You must leave it very much alone or else it will become your master. Here so understand this afternoon the reason why you and I need rescue. The reason why you and I need deliver is because of S-I-A and sin. Isn't that the prodigal there? In chapter 15 of Luke, oh, he said, I have sinned. Tell me, prodigal, who have you sinned against? He said, I have sinned against heaven. So people think I have sinned against my wife. I have sinned against my girlfriend. I have sinned against whatever. And that is true, dear soul. But all sin is against me. Against thee. And the only have I sinned. I trust your soul something of the seasons of sin. But realize that you and I will realize as never before, friend, from the Holy Scriptures, that the reason why you and I need our sins forgiven, why we need to be saved, it is because of your sin and my. So I see 
the great concern in the chapter to be saved. Then I see great certainty in this verse. Thou shalt be saved. Oh, we wouldn't stand here and we couldn't tell you, oh yes, we must tell you why we need to be saved. The reason is our sin, but we want to tell you of the glorious possibility that you can be saved. Thou shalt be saved. Oh, we're glad to announce another time that grace is flowing like a river. Millions have been supplied, and this afternoon it flows just as fresh as ever from the Saviour's wounded side. That's what John tells us in his Gospel in chapter 3 and verse 17. Oh, he tells us the certainty. Oh, he says, God sent not his Son into the world, no, no. To condemn the world, no. God sent him that you and I might be saved. Would that encourage someone in the car park today? Oh, yes, we must be saved and we need to be saved. We see the concern in the text, but I see the certainty in the text. We can be saved. And we want to tell you their soul, there's no need for anyone in their, to remain in their sins this afternoon. For thank God it's gloriously possible for you as you sit in the car, understanding your need and appreciating Christ. For thank God you could be saved even this very afternoon. So I see great certainty. Thou can be, we can be saved. Grace is flowing, we say again, like a river. And the gospel invitation goes out another afternoon. You need to be saved, but thank God you can be saved. Oh, so someone tell us quickly how we can be saved. You want to see the center of the text. And the central message in the text is Christ. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him Christ, you see, salvation is found alone in Christ alone. And what Peter preached in Acts 4 and 12. In that beautiful text, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other. Why? There's no other name. There's no other person. There's no other way. Now the Lord Jesus said himself in John 14 and 6, Oh, he says, I am the way. Christ is the way. Salvation, the center of salvation, the center of being saved is Christ. And Christ alone, none other, there's none other name, Jesus alone. Jesus alone. It's Jesus alone can save. We can tell you all in your soul, we must be saved. We can tell you, you can be saved. And we direct you today to Christ and to Christ alone. Why is Christ the one that can save sinners? We have it in the text. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. There we have it. We have it because of Christ's death. We bring that before you again from this text. That Christ really died. Oh, we thank God that Christ came. What a message down from the glory. We sometimes sing the Savior came. Thank God Christ Jesus came into the world. Now what Paul told Timothy writing in his first chapter of the first epistle, he says, Timothy, this is a faithful saying. What is it? Worthy of all acceptation, what is it that Christ Jesus came? Here, so we're glad to tell you that down from the glory, the Savior came. Christ Jesus came into the world. We read in 1 John 4 and 14, the Father, that's God, sent his Son, what to be? To be an example of he was that. No, there. So he sent him to be a saviour of the world. To be your saviour and to be my saviour. And that meant not only Christ coming. That not only meant Christ living here amongst men. But that meant Jesus Christ, God's only son, going to Calvary. You remember when we opened our, our meeting here, we were telling you and I and trying to emphasise that you and I are sinners. And that's the reason we need saved. But we needed a saviour that was sinless. And we needed a saviour that never sinned. And it's found alone in Christ. And thank God the one that the world needed, God sent. And the one that was suitable and one that was capable. And the only one that was able was God's beloved son. And he took himself outside Jerusalem city. And he allowed men to put him on a cross outside on the hillside. As we often sing. There is a green hill far away without a city wall where our dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. 
And there outside the city, lifted up between heaven and earth, was the sinless Savior. I emphasize that again to you, dear souls, this afternoon. Christ Jesus, God's Son, was absolutely sinless, holy, spotless, and pure. On the cross of Calvary, when this text, we see that he really died. Now the scripture tells us over and over again about the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. See, our sins was a problem. Isaiah 53 and 5 reminds us it was our transgression, our iniquity. But he was wounded. And on the cross there the Lord Jesus was wounded. God made to meet upon him. Isaiah 53 and 6. God made to meet upon Christ the iniquity of us all. And on the cross God who was holy. When Christ was on the cross laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Paul preaching he says Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for our sin. And that's the message we bring before you. Here in Balamoni another time. Salvation is found alone in Christ alone. He alone has died. Our brother, in, as he opened the meeting in prayer, brought before us that text concerning Christ, that he died, and he died alone. And thank God he did. Christ died alone. Christ shed his precious blood alone. And thank God what God's throne demanded. There was a moment on the cross when Jesus Christ cried, It is finished. It's done. It's completed. It's all paid. Everything that God's throne demanded, everything that you and I needed as sinners, Christ finished perfectly at Calvary. And thank God we say when the Savior cried, Finished. Everything was fully done. Done as God himself would have it. Christ the victory fully won. So I see the center and how you and I can be saved. The central person is Christ and Christ alone. I see something else in this text. I see the cornerstone in the text that God has raised him from the dead. Do you hear that dear soul? Not only will you preach a Savior that has come, a Savior that has died, but a Savior that was buried, yes. Is that at all? No, dear soul. We tell you, God raised him from the dead. We have that in Acts chapter, is it 13 and verse 30? Those seven words, seven words, and we have him in the center, but God raised from the dead him. Did you hear that soul? We sound in Balamari another time. Christ was raised from the dead, proving beyond the shadow of all doubt. Proving beyond the shadow of all doubt that God was satisfied. And everything God's throne demanded, Christ paid his food. And not a mite was left in pain, and God raised him from the dead. There's a cornerstone of the gospel. Oh, what a pillar. Christ died, that's good, yes. Christ was buried, yes. But the third day Christ was raised again from the dead. We feel like shouting just now at the top of our voice. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Thank God for a risen Christ. Thank God for an exalted Christ. And friend, he's ready. And he's willing. And he's able to see. Won't there any today? So someone, how can I get? We have it in the text here. Here's the responsibility of every sinner. I can't get saved for you. You can't get saved. Your mother can't save you. Your father can't save you. No, the preacher can't save you. Salvation is an individual, personal matter between the soul, the sinner, whose sins deserve eternal death, and God, and the remedy in Christ. If thou shalt, here we have your responsibility. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. It's not just a mental ascent as it were. No, dear soul, and believe in thine heart. It is when a soul realizes, here I am, I'm a guilty sinner. Here I am, I'm just a sinner, only fit for hell. My sins deserve judgment. But Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ has been raised. 
and agree with God regarding yourself that I'm just a lost sinner. But appreciate that God has loved me and Christ has paid for me. And we have it down the first how a soul gets saved as well. Whosoever, there's the company. I said someone, I thought this was just for a, a select few. Not at all so. The message that we carry and the message we preach here in Balamone this Sunday in August, we tell you, as for the whosoever, whosoever believeth, we have that further down the chapter, whosoever shall call. And here we have in verse number nine, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Jesus is Lord, not only Saviour, he's my Lord. I'll trust him now. In the language of your soul this afternoon to be, friend Jesus, I will trust thee. I'll trust thee with my soul. I'm guilty. I'm lost. I'm helpless. Thou canst make me whole. There is none in heaven nor on earth like thee. Thou hast died for sinners. Therefore, Lord, for me, the choice is yours. So as I bring this meeting soon to a close, the choice is yours. If Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. He has died and been buried, raised in the priceless pain. And I trust him as Savior and Lord. And here's the promise of the certainty of the word of God. Thou shalt be saved. No ifs and buts and maybe. No waiting dear soul to cross the other side in eternity to see how things will be. No friend, it's here and now. God wants you to know here and now, not only you need to be saved, but you can be saved. But by trusting Christ, you are saved. God wants you to know that. Now what John writes in his epistle, he says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, he says, I write that you may know. Friend, it's possible to know that you're saved. It's possible to know that you're on the way to heaven. It's possible to be absolutely sure that you'll never be in hell. And that's what's preached here in this glorious text in Romans 10 and 9. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Oh, listen to the certainty of it, friend. Don't leave the part in any doubt this afternoon. Thou shalt be saved. We have the same text, the same truth in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Question asked in verse 30. What must I do to be saved? The answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the end of verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I can remember well as a child of eleven appreciating God's love and Christ's death for a sinner like me and receiving Christ. I knew I had the eternal security. I knew I had the word of God. God promises eternal life. Salvation to those that put their trust in him. There's a great calamity before us in Jeremiah 8 and 20. Not Maybe that describe you as you sit in the car. Maybe those two words describe you now just as you sit in the car listening reverently to the word of God. Not saved. I couldn't think of anything more sad. Living, yes. Here on earth, yes. But not saved. If the Lord comes to your soul and you like that, what a tragedy. To realize I'm not saved and the Lord has come. To realize I'm not saved and I'll never be saved. Well, I've no more opportunity. Or to die like that, just as you sit in the car not saved. To die not saved, have you counted the cost? To die without Christ and your soul to be lost. Oh, dear soul, what a calamity. Here's these people in their language was. The harvest passed. As the time of ingathering. The summer, the time of opportunity. What a time of ingathering, friend. Now is the time for you to be saved. Grace is flowing with coated again, like a river. Millions have been supplied this afternoon. It flows as fresh as ever. 
a time of end, a time for you to get saved, boys and girls, when I cry the Lord listen to my voice this afternoon. Now is the time for you to get saved. Now is the season. Now is the opportunity. Now is the time for you to get saved. What a tragedy. In the gospel read about those when the bridegroom came, those who were ready went in. Imagine the door shut and those left and those others. Friend, that will take place all these days. The Lord will come. Then grace no more and say, Yet there is room. Take care of your shoulders I close. That this calamity would never be your experience. That the harvest is past. And the summer is in. And I'm not saved. We would put her here to hell tonight, this afternoon, that's what we would hear. Not saved. Any hope? No hope. Friend, I tell you now is the time. Will there be ways that I wish be saved by not today?